Good morning, everybody. I am here with Chief Gary Ross, who's going to be helping us get through the next hour and ten minutes. And I say helping us get through because this is going to be a very emotional hour. Isn't very, it? Uh, very tough. It's going to be uh, rough, but I am looking forward to it. It appears that, as usual, the Navy is right on schedule. The Chief of Naval Operations has just arrived. This is scheduled to begin promptly at 10. Until we get rolling here, we're going to ask Gary to tell us a little bit about what we're going to expect in the next hour. This is really a very traditional ceremony for the Navy. A decommissioning of a carrier is really no different from a decommissioning of every any other ship. Is that correct? Exactly. A lot of uh, pomp and circumstance, a lot of uh, tradition. You'll see uh, here some very emotional, stirring speeches from some of the men who have either commanded the ship or have served aboard her in a, in a battle force commander role, uh, there isn't going to be a dry eye in the house, I'll guarantee you. There are 5,000 people here in these folding chairs behind us, and they really represent all sorts of folks who have a connection to the Saratoga. Probably the largest group uh, would be the plank owners, and these were the first men who served on Saratoga. Why do they call them plank owners? What's the significance of that, Gary? The significance is uh, back in the olden days in the Navy, uh, most of the ships were made of wood. So when the first crew came aboard, they were known as plank owners because afterwards when their decks were replaced and so forth, they were given a piece of the ship, and it was the deck, and it was made of wood. That's why they're called plank owners. And these fellows today have certificates, right, that uh, says they're You better plankers. believe they do. <laughs> they're very proud of those. I was with some of those gentlemen last night. One man told me a story. He said, you know, I'm from a town in West Virginia with 4,200 people. When I was 17 years old, they plunked me down in New York City on a floating city with more people than my hometown. And that's why he's here today. There was nothing in his life, no event, that made that kind of significance. And there are many stories like that, Gary. Very, very many. Uh, for a lot of men, uh, they come here as, uh, as young boys, really, 17, 18 years old. But I can tell you that after a two or three year tour, to, uh, tour aboard any ship, uh, whether it be an aircraft carrier or destroyer, uh, they leave there as, as men. Many of the young fellows who were on this ship today, they have been rehearsing for this event all week long in the heat. How many times can you walk? And, and what they're doing behind us is called manning the rails, which is, of course, one of the most beautiful sights. Uh, we're familiar with that here at Mayport. We're going to uh, listen in now as we begin to hear the beginnings of uh, the VIPs who this show up it. first, right? The captain, uh, the chief of naval operations, the commander of the Naval Air Force's Atlantic Fleet, they're all arriving right now, as you can hear by the bells. Very good. Let's listen and hear arriving, who's arriving, coming. United 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 Navy. Navy. Arriving. arriving. Naval Air Force Atlantic Fleet arriving. Congresswoman Tilly Fowler of Florida, arriving. Naval operations arriving.
decks the 19-gun salute. The official party is now proceeding to the dais. Chief Ross, tell us a little bit about the man who is officially the MC of the decommissioning ceremony. The MC of today's ceremony is Captain Jim Cannon. He's the Saratoga's navigator. And uh, he just attained the rank of captain in June. And uh, he will be uh, giving all the orders for the men to uh, decrew the ship and also for uh, all the different orders for uh, how the ceremony will run. There's also a significance to the woman who will sing our national anthem. That's true. It's uh, Dorothy Smith, and she is the wife of uh, Saratoga's Command Master Chief. He is our senior enlisted on board Saratoga, and it's uh, Master Chief Smith's wife. So what we're about to see after the VIPs have mounted the dais is there will be a parade of colors, and then Mrs. Paul Smith, Dorothy Smith, will sing the national anthem. Parade the colors. As I mentioned, there are 5,000 folding chairs here for the invited guests. Actually, the general public had an opportunity to come if they would have requested an invitation. That's how all the invitations were awarded. Isn't that correct, Chief Ross, that you had to write to the SARA? Correct. That uh, all started back in uh, December and January of this past year. And uh, what happened was all you have to do is was write the ship. And we had a decommissioning ceremony coordinator, and he would reply with the uh, general admission pass. And that's all it would, would uh, have taken to uh, get into the ceremony today. So these people are certainly the family members of the current crew members, the last crew of the Saratoga. As we mentioned, the plank owners, probably the group, the largest single year of, uh, of retirees who were here from 1957 from that maiden cruise. And who else is in this audience today? Well, uh, be besides them, we've got a lot of flag officers. We've got both active duty admirals uh, uh, here today and also some uh, retired flag officers. And 19 of the 30 commanding officers of Saratoga are here today. 19 of the current commanding officers out of 30 that have served on Sarah. Well, 
the color. Commander Thomas Murphy, Saratoga's command chaplain, will deliver the invocation. Let us pray. Eternal Father, strong to save, we ask your blessing on us as we prepare to decommission this United States ship, Saratoga. We give thanks for your loving protection for 38 years in preserving her from the dangers of the sea and the violence of enemies. Help us now to celebrate her distinguished service to preserve liberty and freedom. Help us now to be thankful for those who have served in her with courage, dedication, and honor. Finally, help us to be reminded of your concern for mankind and for the dignity of life, this nation and this ship have been dedicated to preserve. In your most holy name, we offer this prayer. Amen. Will the guests please be seated? Saratoga, parade rest. Ladies and gentlemen, commanding officer, USS Saratoga. Captain Bill Kennedy. Honorable Tilly Fowler, Admiral Porter, Vice Admiral Allen, Rear Admiral Don Weiss, Admiral David McDonald, former Chief of Naval Operations, Vice Admirals, Rear Admirals, Mrs. Jeannie Wright, 
Delighted to have you here today, Jeannie. For I know Rear Admiral Wright, our battle group commander, is with us in spirit from his current flagship, USS Watts, off the coast of Haiti. Deployed once again in charge of Operation Support Democracy, I know he wanted very much to be here today. Honorable Mr. Ed Austin, retired flag officers, former commanding officers, representatives from Saratoga County, New York, Commodores, Captains, Commanding Officers, Saratoga Officers and Men, and Saratoga supporters throughout Mayport, Jacksonville, and the entire country. I hope I didn't miss anybody. Thank you for being here today for this magnificent ceremony in honor of the history-making accomplishments of Super Sarah. Our unrelenting spirit is alive, and you are a testimony that it is here with us today. Before I introduce the first speaker, I would like to, to quickly introduce the people on the dais. From my right, Rear Admiral Don White. I call him Mr. Saratoga. He provided that inspirational leadership needed to get the ship and crew from a very low point in Sarah's history to the best trained carrier as she set sail for her last deployment. How can anyone forget his famous words, keep smiling. Admiral Mike Borda, Chief of Naval Operations, what a great story his career has been. The right leader at a time so critical to our Navy and nation. Honorable Tilly Fowler, Congresswoman, House of Representatives. Vice Admiral Richard C. Allen, Commander, Naval Air Force, Atlantic Fleet. Saratoga is but just one of eight carriers he is responsible for. And finally, to my left, Senior Chaplain for Saratoga, Father Murphy. Believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, the individual with the toughest job is Father Murphy. Who do you think we go to when we are in need of help? Father Murphy, the success of Saratoga and the care of the crew is directly attributed to your example of love and understanding. I know I could not have done it without you. It is now my distinct honor to introduce Honorable Tilly Fowler a true supporter of Saratoga and the Navy. She has continually played a vital role in the Jacksonville community while serving a variety of positions from White House Office of Consumer Affairs and President of the Jacksonville City Council to a member of the Armed Forces Service Committee. A strong advocate of national defense, a natural leader who gets things done, she is a firm believer in returning Congress to the people. We of Saratoga owe her a special gratitude for the heartfelt, sincere remarks made to the Congressional Record, June 21, 1994, when special recognition was given to the accomplishments of Saratoga, her 38 years of outstanding performance in the defense of our great nation, and in particular to Super Sarah's last deployment. It is extremely refreshing and comforting to know we have such great leadership in Washington who understands and appreciates what we do and what our outstanding sailors sacrifice for their country. It gives me great pleasure to present to you Congresswoman Tilly Fowler. Thank you very much, Captain Kennedy. It is a great honor for me to be here and I deeply appreciate the opportunity to participate in this historic ceremony. On behalf of our community, I want to also welcome all of our honored guests, and especially our Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Mike Border. Without him, I would not be here today. And the many other members of the Saratoga crews, past and present, who are able to be with us today. Since the earliest days of our republic, and the days of the great wooden sailing ships, Americans have had a deep and abiding affection for their Navy. And that affection is felt very strongly by all of us here in North Florida. We have always had a special relationship with the Navy, and we feel a great deal of pride in the ships and crews with whom we share our home. Because of that special relationship, this is a bittersweet day for us all. We are sad, because today we will see the decommissioning of this great ship. 
our nation's oldest active duty aircraft carrier and a part of our lives for so long. But we are also filled with gratitude and with pride in the Sarah and her crew and the devotion they have shown in serving our nation and protecting our shores. The Sarah has inspired all of us as she has inspired others around the globe. She has fought bravely against our enemies. She has brought aid and comfort to our friends. She has played host to presidents and nurtured the careers of many future leaders. She has witnessed great conflict and great courage. And for many of us, she has simply always been there during one of the longest carrier home port relationships in the Navy. So we will see her decommissioned with a few tears today. But as we bid farewell, we will also remember with great affection and respect the important role she has played for the last 38 years in the defense of our country and in our lives. We will remember our many friends who served aboard her. We will take renewed pride in her long tradition of honorable service and we will send her last crew off to their next assignments with prayers for their safekeeping and hearts full of gratitude for all they have done for Jacksonville and for our nation. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Rear Admiral Donnelly Weiss. Congresswoman Fowler, flag officers, distinguished guests, friends, and most importantly this morning, past and present members of the USS Saratoga crew. I'd like to add my personal welcome and sincere thanks to all of you who have come here this morning to honor this great ship, her past, and the men who've sailed in her. It is indeed fitting that our keynote speaker is one such gentleman, having been the battle group commander in Saratoga. Admiral Borders' distinguished career is outlined in your program, so I will uh, refrain from simply restating what is already written. Those of us who have sailed in Saratoga are acutely aware that the success of a ship so large lies in the dedication and performance of the young sailors who make up the crew. Think about what you've read in the newspaper over the last several weeks, especially about those young 18, 19, 20 year olds across the country. It's not always a pretty picture. However, the performance of this same age group at sea is certainly a Navy success story. And Admiral Borda, by design, has had an extremely positive impact on the self-esteem those young sailors feel. Yes, he did work his way through those ranks, but he's kept the awareness focused on this group's contribution, their hardships, and their peculiar needs. He is indeed their biggest supporter. As battle group commander in Saratoga, it was not unusual to find the admiral driving U-boats with the crew. It is said that his coxswain rarely got to drive the barge. I know of no surface warrior who has spent more time airborne with his air wing. Pure enjoyment, you say, yes, but to the Sandman, as aviators affectionately knew him, getting close to the deck plates is an obsession. Then, as Chief of Naval Personnel, he ensured that people programs were in place and most importantly, actively used. More recently, during NATO Operation Provide Promise and Deny Flight, as the Joint Commander, Admiral Borda ensured the troops on this carrier, isolated in the Adriatic, understood the importance of their role via videotapes, which he made well after a full day's work. 
The career of Admiral Border is punctuated with service to the young seamen and airmen that have made this ship great. It's important to remember that a ship is but cold steel. The heart, personality of a ship like Saratoga is the crew. Sailors are the lifeblood. Admiral Mike Borda has made a career of providing the nourishment that sustains that lifeblood. In the business of sailing ships, to be called a sailor's sailor is the highest praise one can receive from the deck plates. So it is with great privilege and distinct honor for me to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, a sailor's sailor, the 25th Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Mike Borda. Good morning, Captain Kennedy, crew of the Saratoga, Representative Fowler, Don, Sweet Pea, Skippers, and today, whether you were, you ended up as an admiral or a captain, I think if you were a former skipper of Saratoga, you're thinking about those days now, not others. As we flew uh, down here this morning, I spent a lot of time thinking about what I might say as we bid farewell, not only to an important ship, but also an important era in naval history and in the history of naval aviation. Oh yes, I had a speech all prepared, and it was a great speech. It talked about how effective carriers are, that they're the backbone of American presence all around the world, that every president, and most recently the current president, and I heard him say it, always ask in times of crisis, where are the carriers? And quite often, I might add, Saratoga herself was the one that answered that call. My speech, the one I had prepared to deliver, mentioned Wheelis Air Force Base in Libya. You might wonder what that's all about. It was a base, you might recall, it was conceived in the 1950s and paid for in the 1950s just as this ship was conceived and paid for in that decade. The airfield in Libya is still operating all right. We know that because we visited it in 1986 with aircraft flying from United States Navy aircraft carriers. Saratoga, on the other hand, has sent her aviators and their aircraft to the skies over Vietnam, the waters of the Gulf of Sidra, the dangerous airspace of the Middle East, the deadly skies over Bosnia, where the war still rages on. Yes, my speech, the one I'm not going to give this morning, talked of these things and more. But as we flew south, getting closer to Mayport and our ship, I realized I needed a different kind of speech. And so, instead of those things, let me talk of this ship, the people who have been a part of her, and the end of an era. Our Super Sarah was born in New York in 1952 when she was laid down. She was launched in 1955, and she was commissioned in April of 1956, three short months after a young seaman recruit named Mike Porta came in our Navy. Over the years, she has been watched after, commanded and loved by several men, many of whom are with us today and will be recognized individually by the skipper when he speaks. But for right now, would the former commanding officers of our ship please stand and be recognized. <laughs> Guys, I didn't know any good way to do it. If we had been 
in a different setting, I would have asked you all to come up here because you belong on the ship today. So in the spirit of that, Bill Kennedy and Don Weiss are here for each and every one of you. Last weekend, I attended the commissioning of a new ship. At just the right moment, the sponsor, happened to be my wife, said in an emotion-filled voice, she almost didn't get through it, but she said, bring our ship to life. At that moment, hundreds of crew members ran to the ship, came aboard, and manned the rail, just the way they're doing today. It was a special time, and as most traditions do, the act of doing it made an important point. Ships are, as the common wisdom says, and Don Weiss just said, just steel and other materials. They are not alive. It is the people who bring a ship to life. Now, I believe that. At least I did. Heaven knows I've heard it said, and I've said it myself so many times. But today, as I stand here in a ship we all care so much about, I'm not quite so sure anymore. What about the thousands, the tens of thousands who have put on yellow shirts and white shirts and red shirts and all the other rainbow colors and man that flight deck? Did they not impart some of that fearless spirit and go get them can do attitude to the flight deck itself? Does some of what makes those sailors alive now live in this ship? What about the engineers who breathed life in the engineering spaces, who made a tough steam plant drive this carrier for nearly four decades in the heat? in the tough environment that only steam engineers know about. Does not some of that plant buried deep in Saratoga now contain some of the life of those dedicated engineers who made her go? Throughout this ship are places and spaces where countless sailors, and by sailors I mean all sailors, officers and enlisted, where countless sailors worked and ate and slept and wrote letters home and missed their families and worried about their shipmates and worried about tomorrow, even as they shook off the weariness of today. Do those spaces all throughout our Super Sarah, do they retain some of the life that those men breathed into her? What of the families who waited? Some of those families waited only to learn their Sarah crew member was not to return home. Does their faith and their sacrifice and their pain still remain somewhere deep inside this ship? And what of the captains and the admirals who sailed in Saratoga? Like others here today, I am one of those who sat alone in the chair, in my case on the flag bridge, while an even more important person, a captain, Dave Frost in my case, was one deck below on his bridge, a part of his ship in every way, a captain who in many respects is the ship, wedded to the ship that becomes as much a part of him as any other part of his body. What of those men? Have they not left something of themselves in this steel, this machine called Saratoga? And what of those special aviators, the men who have flown from this ship and this flight deck? They have known the joy of flying from here. They have known the dangers of war from here. They have felt the special feelings in ready rooms, the gut-wrenching feelings when another did not come back, the joy when they all did. 
Are they not still in those ready rooms in some way that is impossible to explain? And finally, what about those who left the bow or the waste cats never to return? What about the spirits of those valiant aviators who had their last meal in Saratoga, their last handshake, their last look into someone's eyes, someone who thought of them as shipmate, squadron mate, aviators whose last step on this earth was a step from this flight deck into eternity. What of them? Does a part of them still live in this ship? I think it does. I think I know the answer to all of those questions, and the answer to each and every one of them is yes. This ship is alive, just as all who have served in it are alive, either in reality, such as, as those of us who are here today, or in spirit and in memory, as those who have served but served no more. Saratoga is super Sarah. We, all of us, have made her more than a ship. She is a part of us, and we are a part of her. So, just as when a person is finished, and their time on this earth is no more, Sarah will live on in our memories, but there is more. She will live on in our history. Others, long after we're gone, will remember her and they will be proud, just as we are proud. But there is still more. The world is not a peaceful place. Oh, we all wish it could be, but it is not. There are wars today, and I am sorry to say there will be wars in the future. Our Navy, God willing, a strong Navy, will be part of them. And there will be aircraft carriers, and there will be sailors manning them. And there will be aviators flying from their decks, carrying the fight forward, winning, and yes, sometimes dying for their country and their cause. And each time one of those catapults fires, each time the noise and fury of the flight deck rises again, each time a pilot feels the rush of acceleration and the joy of flight, each time a carrier turns into the wind, and each time the boss says, recovery complete, each and every time these things happen, and they will. Our Super Sarah and all she means to us will live again. Thank you and God bless you. <laughs> Captain Kennedy, would you join me at the podium, please? Would you please read the citation? The President of the United States takes pleasure in presenting the Legion of Merit to Captain William H. Kennedy for service set forth in the following citation. For exceptionally meritorious conduct in the performance of outstanding service while serving as commanding officer USS Saratoga from February to August 1994, immediately assuming command following the sudden loss of Saratoga's commanding officer, Captain Kennedy's breadth of carrier experience and strength of character provided Saratoga and the embarked air wing with the critical inspirational leadership required during extraordinary trying times of great importance to national interest and multinational peacekeeping efforts in the former Republic of Yugoslavia. When it was questionable if Serbian forces would comply with UN mandates to withdraw artillery pieces from war ravaged Sarajevo, Captain Kennedy's actions were directly responsible for ensuring the uninterrupted presence of Saratoga based strike and combat support sorties over Bosnia and Herzegovina, a pivotal contribution that saved lives and furthered humanitarian efforts. As Saratoga's last commanding officer, his grace, boundless energy, and loyalty to his ship and those who served in her ensured Saratoga was relieved from active service commensurate with her distinguished role in naval history. Captain Kenny's superb leadership skills, distinctive achievements, 
and unselfish devotion to duty reflected great credit upon himself and were in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. For the President, John H. Dalton, Secretary of the Navy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Commanding Officer, USS Saratoga, Captain Bill Kennedy. Admiral, thank you for that award. That award is deserved by 2,700 other sailors who work every day and back you in, in every way. So thank you, sir. Honorable Tilly Fowler, Admiral Borda, Sir Admiral Weiss, thank you for those profound remarks in honor of Saratoga. She is a great lady and has served her country well. Before I begin my remarks, I would like to extend special recognition to the Orlando Band, directed by Lieutenant Commander Paston, for providing that touch of professionalism in making this ceremony memorable. And also special thanks to Mrs. Dorothy Smith, wife of our Saratoga's Command Master Chief, for the patriotic rendition of the National Anthem. Thank you very much. I will not bore you with the litany of so many who made this day possible, but I would like to pay special tribute to the officers and crew of Saratoga who worked so hard and devoted countless hours of their time in an effort to orchestrate this time-honored ceremony. Hard work, personal sacrifice, doing things right with style. Where do we get such caliber of men? They are truly the world's greatest. Can anyone, thank you, can anyone in just a few short minutes adequately capture the history, the purpose, the energy, the true spirit of Super Sarah? It would be like trying to put into words the heartfelt sadness and loneliness endured in the hugs and kisses and handshakes when a crew departs on a long six-month deployment for the excitement and nervous anticipation in returning home to our loved ones after completing our mission. Can one really do justice to the tears of sacrifice or the uninhibited smiles? The task before me seems insurmountable and emotionally overwhelming. Life is like a never-ending circle of discovery. With each new beautiful day of our life, we can come closer to knowing the person we are and why we are here. And so it is with the relentless spirit of Saratoga that for 38 years provided a meaning of life and a purpose that enriched the lives of so many. Key to the successes and remarkable legends of Saratoga is its unremitting leadership, our commanding officers, who over the years took on the awesome responsibility for the safety and care of thousands of young men. Admiral Arlie Burke wrote, leadership is understanding people and involving them to help you do a job. That tasks all of the good characteristics like integrity, dedication of purpose, selflessness, knowledge, skill, implacability, as well as a determination not to accept failure. Today, we are extremely fortunate to have in our audience 19 former commanding officers that I would like to introduce to you. I am sure their names will be familiar to many and will bring back special and fond memories. Some may appear just a little bit older, but I promise you their zest for life remains as strong as ever. And I ask you please to hold your applause to after I introduce all of them. It is a great honor to start with the very first commanding officer, well known to so many here in Jacksonville, Vice Admiral Robert J. Stroh, commanding officer, April 1956 to December 1956. Next, Rear Admiral Roger W. Maley, commanding officer, November 1960 to November 1961. 
Rear Admiral Valdemar G. Lambert, Commanding Officer, Rear November 1961 to November 1962. Captain John E. Lacatour, Commanding Officer, September 1963 to October 1964. Rear Admiral Jack M. James, Commanding Officer, October 1964 to September 1965. Captain Joseph M. Tully, Commanding Officer, October 1966 to September 1967. Rear Admiral DeWitt L. Freeman, Commanding Officer, August 1970 to August 1971. Vice Admiral James R. Sanderson, Commanding Officer, August 1971 to February 1973. Captain Lewis C. Page, Commanding Officer, February 1973 to September 1974. Vice Admiral Robert F. Dunn, Commanding Officer, September 1974 to September 1976. Rear Admiral Charles B. Hunter, Commanding Officer, September 1976 to February 1978. Vice Admiral Edward H. Martin, Commanding Officer, February 1978 to July 1979. Rear Admiral James H. Flatley III, Commanding Officer, July 1979 to October 1981. Vice Admiral Jack Reddy, Commanding Officer, November 1983 to March 1985. Vice Admiral Jerry L. Unruh, Commanding Officer, March 1985 to August 1986. Vice Admiral David E. Frost, Commanding Officer, August 1986 to March 1988. Captain James T. Matheny, Commanding Officer, 1988 to April 1990. Rear Admiral Joseph S. Mobley, Commanding Officer. My late husband, Lieutenant Commander F.W. Wright III, was flying off Saratoga in 1972 when he was shot down, declared missing in action, then killed in action. Finally, in 1990, Hanoi released his remains so he could make his final trip home. Please, if at all possible, upon her decommissioning, my two grown children and I would greatly appreciate an invitation to attend the ceremony. Thank you. Sincerely, Mrs. F.W. Wright III. Mrs. Wright and your children, would you please stand? The second letter is part of a letter that was sent to the parents of Lieutenant Scott Bubick, who was killed in an aircraft accident while operating in the Adriatic Sea during the night flight and provide promise operation in April of this year. No one can fully understand the burden of grief at the loss of a son or a daughter that parents must endure unless they experience it themselves. We can only try to imagine the unbelievable hurt and void that all of a sudden becomes a reality in our lives. Scott was an inspiration to us all, a superb naval aviator, the epitome of a naval officer, and an exemplary gentleman whose infectious enthusiasm affected everyone who had the pleasure to know him. He was a friend to all and definitely very special. 
Why God challenges us and calls someone to be with him much sooner than anyone planned will always be a mystery and certainly a test to our faith. As a naval aviator, I know the thrill and challenge of carrier aviation, a profession unique and unlike no other, but also inherently dangerous. We treasure the squadron life and mourn greatly the loss of one of the best. The loss of your son has made this ship and air wing team realize how fragile life can be and more determined than ever to meet our tasking professionally and safely. Scott did not die in vain. He gave his life for his country, and perhaps in doing so, we will someday see peace in the world and end the terrible suffering of so many. In the words of Admiral Chester Nimitz, uncommon valor was a common virtue. For more than 38 years now, the spirit of Saratoga has exemplified uncommon valor, a common virtue. This huge gray hull, long as the Empire State Building is tall, a floating city of 5,000 men, thrown together from all walks of life, every race, every creed, every color, disciplined and trained for a mission, given a purpose, working hard and asked to sacrifice much for a higher goal. What a great concept. Perhaps the words of General MacArthur can capture this undefeatable spirit of Saratoga. Duty, honor, country. Words that dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, and what you will be. As I stand here on her elevator for the final time, and you gaze upon her magnificent profile, there seems to be an almost peaceful appearance, a feeling of contentment, a restful spirit. 38 years ready to answer all bells. At times when I stand on the pier and look up at this grand old lady, there is almost a lifelike sense about her, sort of a proud warrior who has come home to retire knowing full well we did it, mission accomplished. I'm sure that the many commanding officers before me, as they approached the end of their tour, walked the decks of Saratoga, knowing full well it soon would be their last time. Someone else would be taking their place and carrying the Saratoga spirit onto brighter and new horizons. I too walked the decks of Saratoga, knowing the final end was near. An early riser, I routinely toured the ship long before Reveille. It is amazing the ability to sense a ship while most of its crew rests, and the morning watch well ahead of the day schedule is keeping the ship safe and operating smoothly. From the bridge to the flight deck, from the O3 level to the hangar deck, down to the second deck to damage control central, and to one of the main engineering spaces. The entire walk normally takes about 45 minutes, depending on what you saw or who you spoke to on watch. My last walk on Sarah at sea was a private one, and I did not say much to any of the crew except an acknowledgement by a nod of the head or a good morning as someone would call out, hello, skipper. We all knew the end was finally near, and although there was a tremendous feeling of accomplishment, there was a hidden awareness that something was different. I wanted to just listen for the last time to Super Sarah. The huge screws turning, the boilers burning bright, the steam and vacuum pressure steady, the engineering officer of the watch directing the main spaces, make preps to light fires and four Bravo boiler, bring number two evaporator on the line. Up on the second deck, the aft galley is preparing breakfast you can hear the sizzling of bacon, the thousands of eggs being scrambled, and the smell of fresh baked bread. In the hangar bays, aircraft move continuously through the night. Take 102, 503, 601 to the roof. Put aircraft 405 on jacks for a gear check. And deep in the combat information center on the O3 level, the intel experts have been busy for hours preparing briefs for the air crews. And up on the flight deck, Aircraft moves continually into the early dawn and always the constant wind. 
Another night of 35 plus knots with 100 plus sortie day on the schedule. Catapult checks and no load shots have already begun. The ship shakes after each shot. The aircraft handler works magic once again with hundreds of moves of the 45 plus aircraft on deck to make ready for the first launch. Voices shout, direction, whistles blow, aircraft are chocked, tie down chains are set. A kaleidoscopic choreography of young men unlike no other in the world. As I return to the bridge, I am greeted by the greatest four words in the Navy. Captain's on the bridge. I receive a status report from the officer's deck. Good morning, Captain. Ensign Suber has a con, six ballers on the line. All eight SSTGs are up and operating. All four catapults are ready. No surface contacts of interest. We are in our assigned area. First launch in about an hour. And you look out the bridge window and you see the dawn coming into view and the sun creeping over the crisp horizon. It's going to be a great Navy day. Now, after 38 years and more than 60,000 men who have breathed life into this mighty warship, there is only a deafening silence. The catapults are secured. The arresting wires removed. The boilers cold. The bomb elevators are still. Repair lockers are bare. DC Central is empty. No longer seen are the yellow shirts, the brown shirts, the blue shirts, the red shirts, and the green shirts. And in just a few short minutes, the boats and pipes will no longer sound the watch. How does one say goodbye? Perhaps the song by Joshua Cadison says it best. The world will turn and the seasons will change and all the lessons we will learn will be beautiful and strange. We'll have our fill of tears and shares of sighs. My one and only prayer is that you realize you'll always be beautiful in my eyes. Saratoga, Super Sarah, you will always be beautiful in my eyes. I am ready to decommission the USS Saratoga. Vice Admiral Richard C. Allen, Commander Naval Air Force, United States Atlantic Fleet. I got it. Bill, what tremendous words. The world will turn and the seasons will change. As Admiral Borda's commander, Naval Air Force Atlantic Fleet, it is my sad duty to carry out his orders. Captain Kennedy, decommission USS Saratoga. Aye, sir. Adjutant, march off the crew, all down the pennants and colors, secure the watch. Aye, sir. Also the deck, haul down the pennants, Jack and Ensign, secure the watch. Saratoga, attend hut, inboard face, march off.
the USS Saratoga. This is the ceremonial lifeblood of the ship, actually the ceremony when the lifeblood of the ship leaves. The crew is what brings the carrier to life. That's it. What you're watching here is called the decrewing. Uh, the significance of a decrewing is, is as the people are leaving, just like you said, it's like the oxygen coming out of something. It's breathe, taking the breath out of out of the ship itself. It's just part of the old tradition, uh, part of the ceremonial thing. It takes about nine, nine and a half minutes to get all these men off the flight deck. So it'll be it'll be quite some time here. In just a few minutes, you'll hear the adjutant, Captain Cannon, will read the significance of what a, what a decrewing is and what a commissioning and decommissioning is all about. And that's coming up in just a few minutes. Now, when we heard Captain Kennedy say, march off the crew, haul down the pennants, colors and secure the watch. The pennants we're referring to is really the commissioning pennant, which was so high on that mast it wasn't visible, but we do have a picture of that that we were able to take before uh, before today's ceremony. Tell us the significance of the commissioning pennant. The commissioning pennant is dates back uh, years and years, way back into the 18, 17, 1800s. It's actually a coach whip that measures about, right about five or six feet long, and it's got a tethered end on it that's kind of split like a like a V, almost like a snake's tongue. And as it flies through the uh, the air when it's when it's flying up on the main mast, it gets torn up and all tattered and whatnot. And it's it's used when we have a flag officer embarked to, to signify that he's on board. That an admiral is on board. Correct. Now there's also the ship's spyglass, uh, which will be retired, of course, today. And I guess that will go to the Navy Archives? That will. That will go to the Navy Archives. And uh, right now our National Archives are up in Washington, D.C. Now there obviously is a chance that if, and uh, of course I have to say if, if, if the, the ship becomes a museum here in Jacksonville, there's a very good chance that it may be uh, held on board the ship. There's a great story to the ship's wheel. <laughs> kind of a, almost an embarrassing, but fortunately it was saved from embarrassment. Somebody actually took off with the wheel? Somebody actually took the wheel and uh, made uh, fast tracks with it. Uh, but we were fortunate enough to recover the wheel. It was given back to us, and it's in our possession now, and we'll go also to the National Archives. As we mentioned earlier, these 5,000 people who are here today really represent people with a connection to the Saratoga. But I've also noticed we have a couple of Boy Scout troops, and so it is an opportunity for people who um, may not have a, a Navy history in their family if they thought in, in time to write and ask to come uh, to really witness a great moment in Navy history. Right. When you think about the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts and the Cub Scouts and such, they're based on patriotism. I used to be a Boy Scout and a Weeblo, and I know what it's like to be patriotic and love your country. And this certainly is a good way for these young men to come out here and show their love and their patriotism for the United States. Very moving speeches today. Um, and I know that Captain Kennedy's speech, you were able to give us the text of that in, in advance. And I think it's very significant that uh, we had to wait until today to find out what our keynote speaker was saying. He just couldn't put those thoughts on paper until he was almost here. Well, the way Admiral Borda put it, as he, as he said uh, before he started his speeches, it seemed like he changed it on the way here, that uh, he had a speech all ready to go, and then as he was flying down and getting closer to the ceremony, he started thinking about the time on board, and, and, and he changed it. So it's probably better that we didn't get it in advance because he ended up changing it a little bit anyway. Well, and it... it as much as you want to say this is just really a hunk of metal, for the men who have served on this ship, it has always had life. It has always had life. It, uh, just like I like to say, uh, the young men is what makes a ship. It's, uh, it's those kids that uh, still a little wet behind the ears, get on board, learn how to be men, and they make that ship. I've had many retirees over the years tell me about their experiences, and they all say, you know, I was just a baby-faced kid, you know? Uh, I've gained 70 pounds since I wore that uniform, <laughs> and many of them. I noticed that so many of the former commanding officers, of course, are now civilians. They're in their civilian clothes today. Yes, uh, what it is is uh, a lot of them, uh, they have obviously have the option to wear the uniform, but uh, they feel like they've been in the civilian world a little bit longer, and uh, they just want to come and just witness it, to kind of take a back seat. It's, um, it's quite a ceremony for these gentlemen. Uh, I think one fellow said to me yesterday, a young fellow, you know, he's on his first cruise, and he said, you know, after tomorrow I get off the ship and I go to shore duty, that's what I'm looking forward to. It'll be many, many years from now when he will look back and say, my goodness, I was part of that. He'll open up that photo book about 10, 15 years from now, and he'll have maybe a four, five, six-year-old kid, and then all of a sudden, it's going to hit him. And then he's going to realize how important it was for him to be a crew member aboard this <laughs> great ship.
There's a Saratoga Association, and um, I've had the great pleasure of being affiliated with this organization over the last several months. And for many of these men, they hadn't really been in the Navy for 30 years. They hadn't thought much about it. And then something triggers a contact, and they get together with these men. Sometimes they serve decades apart, but they share that common bond of life at sea that you just can't understand unless you've been there. Besides the common bond at sea, uh, you know, as far as the Saratoga is concerned and, and what we feel as crew members aboard the ship, I think the city of Jacksonville plays a big part in, in, in our morale and in how we feel. There's nothing beats coming in off a of deployment or coming in from sea. Not only seeing your family, but seeing these people in Jacksonville who really might not have an affiliation with the Navy, but they're out there to see that ship and to see that crew. And that, 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 that touches you coming in through those jetties. Nothing like it, is there? <laughs> um, it's a beautiful day, too. Just what you were hoping for. Nice and sunny. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what will we witness now after the ship is decrewed, after the last man hits terra firma? Well, then uh, the Captain Kennedy will report that the, sh uh, the ship has been decommissioned. And then himself and Admiral Weiss uh, will proceed off the dais and down the brow. Then they will go up the quarterdeck brow, and they will uh, secure the watch. They will sign. Captain Kennedy will sign the logbook for one last time. He will receive the logbook, and Admiral Weiss will receive the spyglass. And then uh, one last salute to the Saratoga, and they will march off back to the dais. Quite an applause here as it becomes clear that we are very near the end of the decrewing of the USS Saratoga. The commissioning pennant, when hoisted to the main mast, symbolizes the moment when the life of a ship begins. Similarly, when the pennant is finally lowered from the main and handed to the commanding officer, the ship is officially retired.
ladies and gentlemen, from your left, a formation of aircraft from Carrier Wing 17, led by Commander Mark Ziegler of Fighter Attack Squadron 83, will fly over in a final air wing salute to USS Saratoga. Eight aircraft in all in today's flyover. It's a thrill for these pilots since they came back from their final deployment. They haven't had any money in the budget to fly. You are about to hear what naval aviators like to call the sound of freedom. looking at F-18s and S-3 Vikings. Oh, that's always such a magnificent sight. Saratoga, attend hut. Would the guests please be seated? The Command Master Chief. Master Chief Petty Officer Smith will now present the commissioning pennant and colors to the commanding officer. marched off, the pennant and colors have been hauled down, the watch is secured, the USS Saratoga is decommissioned. I am ready to be relieved. Captain, you are relieved. Very well. Thank you, Thank you, sir. Will the guests please rise? Ladies and gentlemen, will you join the crew of Saratoga in observing a moment of silence and a final salute in honor of the men who have served on board and made the ultimate sacrifice by giving their lives in the defense of their country.
Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, as we conclude our farewell to this magnific magnificent Hayes Gray Lady of the Sea, we ask for your continued blessings. May we always treasure and admire the distinguished service of those who gave their lives in service to the country while serving in Saratoga. Give them eternal rest and peace. For every sailor and Marine who lived, worked, and served in Saratoga, we give profound thanks. May we all preserve the fond memories of the lady who brought us growth and enriched life of duty and the exhilarating experience of service at sea. As we depart now, let us rejoice and continue our lives and our service commitments with similar dedication. Grant our leaders your wisdom, peace to our world, and your continued presence and love in our lives. Amen. Retire the colors. Will the past commanding officers of Saratoga, their families, and our flag officer guests please join Captain Kennedy in the official party at the hospitality pavilion on the pier for a cake cutting ceremony, after which all our guests are invited for refreshments. as I thought it would be. Uh, pretty difficult for me. Uh, like I said, when you do one day on that ship, it gets you. I only got to spend six days. I certainly never spent six months deployment, but I had so many fine men let me into their lives. So many families. As Captain Kennedy promised, not a dry eye in the house, certainly not here. <laughs> Chief Ross, you've been wonderful to share your experience. Chief Ross, I should tell you, literally wrote the book on decommissioning. He was responsible for this beautiful program that gives much of the history of this fine ship. Of course, USS Saratoga is the sixth ship to take the Saratoga name, uh, named after a Revolutionary War battle. And there is some question as to whether any other ship will be named Saratoga. That's true. You never know. We may go two, three years, and uh, it would be nice. It certainly would be. Certainly a lot of history there would warrant it, wouldn't it? We do appreciate you being with us and to witness this part of history. Saratoga's been with us for 38 years, and we're so proud of her. We're going to return you to regular programming now. Be sure to stay tuned to our coverage on Eyewitness News at 6 tonight, and in our special report at 7 o'clock, Sarah sails on. For all of us at Eyewitness News, I'm Deborah G. and all this good day.